抓上我砸你狗的你，砸你妈巴一整的，这个你妈巴时候你还妈巴我穿越。China's virus is spreading in China again. Now there's a lockdown in Beijing. We've been reporting the stories for many days now. Some of you have even suggested that all of this may be a ruse to restrict the movements and access of WHO team, the team that is probing the origins of the pandemic in Wuhan. We don't agree with this assessment and here's why. China is already in complete control of the WHO investigation. In fact, it's a farce of an investigation, as we've discussed on the show. China wouldn't want to risk talk of another major outbreak just to control an already compromised probe, especially after Xi Jinping's grand proclamations of victory. This outbreak is egg on his face and a serious threat to the life of China's people. So what is the government doing about it? Blaming the UK strain and clamping down draconian restrictions. On Gravitas tonight, we'll bring you a special report on what's happening in China, how serious this latest surge is. Also on the show, day one of President Joe Biden, the China challenge takes center stage with Beijing sanctioning 28 Americans, including former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Google signs a landmark agreement in France. It will pay to republish news content. New story, old question, when will India crack the whip on tech giants? In Pakistan, no sign of a Wuhan virus vaccine as India supplies vaccines to neighbors and friends. Pakistan remains trapped in its policies of hate. And Baghdad is rocked by its biggest blast in two years. Is this a sign of things to come in an election year in Iraq? We'll discuss. We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. Millions of coronavirus vaccine doses are being shipped by India free of cost to neighboring countries as part of its vaccine diplomacy. Coronavirus vaccines manufactured in India have arrived in Nepal and Bangladesh. Many low- and middle-income countries are relying on India, the world's biggest vaccine maker, for supplies to start their COVID-19 immunization programs. A fire broke out at the Serum Institute of India in Pune, which is manufacturing the Covishield coronavirus vaccine. Five people have lost their lives. Thick clouds of smoke were seen billowing out of one of the buildings in the Institute's complex. As the fire erupted at an under construction site, production of the vaccine will not be impacted. The Prime Minister of Mongolia has resigned a day after thousands protested in the capital over what they said was the heavy-handed treatment of a coronavirus-infected mother and her newborn baby. Twitter has locked the account of China's U.S. Embassy over a tweet that defended China's policies in the Xinjiang region, saying Uyghur women were no longer baby-making machines. The U.S. social media platform says the tweet violates the firm's policy against dehumanization. California WeChat users have sued the app and its parent company Tencent. The users allege that the WeChat mobile app is being used for spying and censoring. According to the lawsuit, comments made on WeChat by users in California to family members in China have led to visits from security agents in China. French aircraft, including Rafale fighter jets, landed at the northern Jodhpur Air Force Base to participate in the military exercises in India. The planes would participate in the war games with Indian Air Force jets in the 2021 Indo-French air exercise Garuda, which has been named Desert Night 21 this year. Garuda is a joint air exercise which started in 2003 and is conducted alternatively in France and India. A group of protesters carrying signs against President Biden and the police marched in the streets of Portland and damaged the headquarters of the Democratic Party of Oregon. Some smashed windows and spray-painted anarchist symbols. Police said eight arrests were made in the area. 
Storms and heavy rains have affected thousands of displaced Syrians living in camps throughout the country's northwest. More than 2,500 tents have been destroyed or damaged across 62 camps, with a severe cold front affecting Syria and Lebanon over the last few days. Spanish giants Real Madrid have crashed out in the third round of the Copa del Rey after a humiliating 2-1 defeat to third division side Alcoyano. The Minos cancelled out Edda Militao's first half opener in the 80th minute to force extra time and despite going down to 10 men, scored with five minutes left to go to clinch a famous upset. Remarkably, this is the fifth time since 2001 that Real Madrid have been eliminated by a third division side. Brooklyn Nets finally fielded their big three of James Harden, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving together for the first time. But the Cleveland Cavaliers denied them a winning debut with a 147-135 to win. The all-star trio scored 98 points in a promising offensive display, but the Nets suffered defensively and Colin Sexton's career-high 42 points led the Cavs to victory after two overtime periods. China's virus is spreading in China again, and now there's a lockdown in the capital, Beijing. It's a story we've been reporting for many days now. It's an outbreak that's growing bigger by the day. China's worst outbreak since March 2020. New clusters are emerging, and China's ham-fisted response and the desperation to contain the outbreak is beginning to show. It began in Hebei. It spread to 11 regions in China's northeast, and now it has reached Beijing. On New Year's Eve, Xi Jinping declared China's victory over China's virus. Perhaps he tempted fate. Within days, the first reports of a virus surge came out, and now there's a lockdown in the capital. The hotspot is the Daxing district in Beijing. Authorities say only two people have tested positive here, but we told you earlier, earlier in the week, how China was getting mass testing horribly wrong, how labs were fudging reports, and asymptomatic super spreaders pose a big risk. The numbers are not clear even to the Chinese officials. The Chinese press is not discussing any of this, though. They want you to focus on something else. They want to plim pin the blame on others. And the target this time is the United Kingdom. China state mouthpieces are blaming the UK strain of the Wuhan virus for this outbreak. They say the new cases have been infected with this UK mutation. It's a claim that's hard to prove independently, to verify independently. We don't know if these people travel to Britain. We don't know if they were in contact with someone who's had this infection. But we can show you how the Global Times has been reporting this story. Look at this, barely two lines, no background information or details about the travel history. This is a narrative that China has aggressively tried to push in recent days. They claim the new cases were actually imported and not locally transmitted. Like I said, we've not been able to confirm any of this, but here's something we'd like to share with you. This is not Beijing's first case this year, and this is by no means a victory over the virus. It's very much around. It is spreading in China. Local transmissions are still happening. As of Wednesday, Beijing reported seven local cases. That's the official figure, and we must always underline the potential difference between the official and the actual figures. Six out of these seven cases were in the district of Daxing. Today, this number shot up to 11. According to some assessments, this is China's worst flare-up since January last year. The worst in a year. It claimed victory prematurely. The local authorities then dropped the ball, and now the virus is spreading again. The draconian lockdowns are back. The lockdown in Beijing is now is partial for the moment, but more than a million residents of Daxing are not being allowed to leave Beijing. Mass testing has been ordered in the entire area. Beijing has now decided to track everyone who entered the city since December the 10th. China's desperation is becoming obvious. Look at what happened in the city of the capital city of Hebei. A video that was shared by a researcher from Human Rights Watch. Look at this carefully. A man dared to step out during the lockdown. A local Communist Party official caught him. He was tied to a tree. He was abused. The Communist Party official even threatened to kill him. You think you might be 
，这个你骂的时候你还骂不穿哟你我。好够了，你骂不来的，这我骂不严的时候你啥你骂不穿哟你。Reports say the Communist Party official in this video has now been suspended. Meanwhile, the government of China has issued orders to cities across the country. They have been asked to gear up for mass testing. This is basically an instruction. They must shore up their testing capabilities. Cities with a population of less than 5 million should be able to Places where more than 5 million people live must do it within 3 to 5 days. If there are only 11 cases in Beijing, why the, in the testing entire cities, in fact, multiple times and still not getting the numbers right, according to some reports. It's a scary repeat of what happened in Wuhan last year. We've been saying this for a while, and now Chinese officials are saying this too. The head of China's Center for Disease Control has given an interview. George Fu Gao is China's top epidemiologist. He has called the outbreak in Hebei, and I'm quoting, a mini Wuhan. More than 1,000 people have been infected in Hebei. Allow me to read some of the quotes from this interview. It is not so large as in Wuhan, but still has local outbreaks. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I must not take the epidemic lightly. They're calling it the epidemic now. Even with millions of tests, a draconian lockdown and threats to citizens, China still sounds unsure about tackling the latest outbreak. It looks like the Lunar New Year celebrations could be cancelled this year. Already curbs have been imposed on gatherings. Now the Chinese state wants to control the movement of people within the country. A negative test report is now mandatory for migrant workers to move. They must get a test done within seven days of their travel. Chinese authorities do, did not say exactly when or how they will impose these new rules, but they did say that these migrant workers will have to pay for the test out of their own pockets. And while all of this is an eerie reminder of what Chinese people suffered last year, it also begs a question. How much is China hiding this time? We'll keep tracking this, but one thing's absolutely clear even now. Things could get wild in China once again. The country's annual spring festival, the Lunar Festival Rush, is now officially underway. And this is what makes it so scary. This is a 40-day period which marks the Lunar New Year in China. And for the second year in a row, it is under threat from the Wuhan virus. A majority of China's 280 million migrant workers, 280 million are expected to travel to their homes, mostly to rural areas. Areas where quarantine facilities are poor, where testing processes are substandard, and public awareness, according to reports, abysmally low. Stopping this migration and preventing the virus from spreading is going to be quite a challenge for Beijing. Here's a report. <laughs> It is the world's biggest celebratory event. It marks the largest human migration on this planet. It is an annual ritual of reunification and overindulgence. A 40-day break that runs from January 10th to February 18. But for the second year in a row, the Lunar New Year, China's largest national holiday, is under threat from a virus that may be of its own making. China is battling its worst outbreak of the Wuhan virus since March 2020. In recent days, there has been a big spike in cases in the province of Hebei. In addition, there have been flare-ups in the provinces of Jilin, Liaoning, Heilongjiang and Yunnan. New cases have also been reported in the commercial hub of Shanghai and the Chinese capital, Beijing. It is a deja vu moment. Just like 2020, 
The viral outbreak has hit just days before millions of people travel across China for the Lunar New Year. But with most international travel suspended, the problem will largely remain within the country. A majority of China's 280 million rural migrant workers travel home to their villages at this time of the year. As compared to 2020, the travel flow this year is set to increase by 10%. We expect to send around 1.7 billion passengers nationwide during the spring festival travel season in 2021, with an average of almost 40 million passengers per day. It is a decrease of more than 40% from 2019 and an increase of more than 10% from 2020. Although the passenger flow has seen a substantial decline, more than in previous normal years, the current daily passenger flow has doubled in comparison. Therefore, the pressure of the Spring Festival transport is still relatively high. The Chinese regime is scrambling to deal with the challenge. The control measures in rural areas are substandard. They have been blamed by officials as weak links that could be responsible for the current outbreaks. Quarantine facilities are poor. The testing process is not up to the mark. Public awareness is abysmally low. And rural clinics are ill-equipped. Stringent lockdown measures and curbs on travel will not really work. China's National Health Commission has made testing mandatory for people returning to rural areas. From spreading the virus to the world, to now battling a new outbreak within. China is going to have a tough time dealing with karma. Bureau report, we on World is One. And now to a story of lost and found. Any idea what I'm referring to? You've seen it already. Jack Ma, the Alibaba founder. Ma has finally reappeared nearly three months after he went missing from the public eye. Jack Ma was recorded speaking to teachers from rural China. He told them, and I'm quoting, we will meet again after the epidemic is over. Someone posted this 50-second video on Twitter. It went viral instantly. Many questioned its authenticity, some questioned its date, but most chose celebration over speculation. Among them was the Hong Kong stock market. Alibaba shares were up 8.5%. The company's valuation rose by $58 billion. Ma's reappearance is being viewed as a big relief for Alibaba and, of course, its investors. But is this story so black and white? Does, does Jack Ma's reappearance promise his safety? Does it mean that Alibaba's bad days are now a thing of the past? The answer lies in history and politics. We'll discuss both. Jack Ma's previous appearance was on the second Bund Summit in Shanghai. This was on the 24th of October 2020. That was the day when Jack Ma criticized China's regulatory system and state-run banks. He called them out for behaving like pawn shops. Chinese authorities went after Ma and his empire. Alibaba's affiliate, the Ant Group, was forced to suspend its $37 billion IPO plan. China also launched an antitrust investigation against Alibaba. The company was probed for suspected monopoly practices. Alibaba's reputation took a hit. The company lost $140 billion. Jack Ma's net worth began fluctuating. Following that, he did not appear in a TV show he was supposed to judge. He also missed other scheduled appearances. His absence fueled speculation. The word was that Chinese authorities had gone after him and that he may be the next Meng Hongwei or Fan Bingbing, the Interpol chief and the famous Chinese actress who faced the wrath of the Chinese state. Adding fire to all the speculation were some open secrets. The rise of the Ant Group had put Alibaba at odds with China's state-dominated financial system. The rise of Jack Ma had put him at odds with Chinese President Xi Jinping. Everyone in China is aware of this. Like we've been telling you, Jack Ma is a poster boy of China. At home, they call him Daddy Ma. Some Chinese youth call him Teacher Ma. Jack Ma is seen as a godfather of entrepreneurship. 
To be honest, he's nothing less than a legend in China. He sings, he dances, he acts, he paints, he fights. Jack Ma's cult has begun threatening Xi Jinping's party state. A system where only one person can be celebrated and that's Xi Jinping himself. And the dictator is not happy with the success story of Jack Ma. One headline read, there is no Jack Ma era, but a Jack Ma in the era. China is also running an anti-Jack Ma campaign online. Reports claim that Jack Ma is being portrayed as a wolf in sheep's attire. And his venture, the ant group, is being painted as a lone shark. Chinese consumers are concerned. And some investors say they have no clarity as to what is going on in Alibaba. Jack Ma may not have been jailed like real estate tycoon Reng Xingjiang or billionaire entrepreneur Sun Da Wu. But his company, Alibaba, is not out of danger. Jack Ma's recent video hints at the entrepreneur buckling under Chinese pressure. Just listen to what Jack Ma told the teachers. And I'm quoting, During this period of time, my colleagues and I have been learning and thinking, and we have become more determined to devote ourselves to education and public welfare. This is not only because I'm a teacher myself, but more importantly, education, especially rural education, is of great importance. Today, our country has achieved complete poverty alleviation, comprehensively promoted the rural revitalization strategy, entered a new stage of development, and is moving towards common prosperity. I'm referring to a transcript published in a Chinese outlet. And if all of this is authentic, including that video, then Jack Ma Stone has evidently taken a 180 degree turn since his Shanghai speech. What does all of this mean? Analysts say that the Chinese government may take over Alibaba. Reports say there are four possibilities that employees in Alibaba are preparing for. Number one, nationalization. Number two, splitting of the business. Number three, more restrictions. Number four, fines. Does any of this sound like the end of troubles for Alibaba? Well, you know the answer. Please raise your right hand. Kamala Davy Harris, do solemnly swear. Kamala Davy Harris, do solemnly swear. Next President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear. Congratulations, Mr. Thank President. You. As Joe Biden was taking oath of office last night, officials at the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs were wide awake. Well, not for the president's inauguration, but for an announcement of their own, an announcement that Beijing was gearing up to make. Barely minutes after Biden took oath, Biden China Jr. shot off a statement not to congratulate the new U.S. president, but to send him a message on how this relationship will be over the next four years. China sanctioned several members of the Trump administration. American citizens. The list is long, but distinguished. A total of 28 individuals are on the sanctions list of China. This includes the outgoing members, as well as the former aides and advisors of Donald Trump. Let me give you some big names sanctioned by China. Mike Pompeo, the former Secretary of State. Peter Navarro, Trump's economic advisor. Robert O'Brien, Trump's national security advisor. Former chief strategist Steve Bannon and former national security advisor John Bolton. The list has 28 names. China has sanctioned their family members too. So how do we see this move and its timing? China has attacked Trump's former advisors for targeting Beijing relentlessly. Those sanctioned cannot do any business with China or Chinese firms. No cushy corporate sector jobs with Chinese companies for them. And the way China went about these sanctions leads us to only one conclusion. Beijing wanted to send a message to Joe Biden on his inauguration day. It wanted to set the tone for future engagements and fire the first shot in the great power battle. 
The dragon was breathing fire on inauguration day and the wolf warriors remain combative in today's press conference. Over the past few years, some anti-China politicians in the U.S., out of their selfish political interests and prejudice and hatred against China, have planned, promoted and executed a series of crazy moves which have gravely interfered in China's internal affairs, undermined China's interests, offended the feelings of Chinese people and seriously disrupted China-U.S. relations. China has for many times pointed out that these politicians will definitely definitely pay the price for their crazy behavior. China said that it hopes the better angels, quote unquote, can defeat the evil forces. Well, I'm not sure if Chinese diplomats will meet any angels from America now because Team Biden hit back with a statement calling the sanctions, quote unquote, unproductive, cynical and an attempt to play to partisan divides. So the next question is, what does Joe Biden plan to do about China beyond issuing the statement? It is increasingly becoming clear that America will not be able to battle China alone. Its position as the world's only superpower has diminished significantly. Even Joe Biden during campaigning conceded this. He inherits a foreign policy where allies are questioning America. The US needs more partners, strategic allies. This is a fact that even members of Team Biden have acknowledged, like Kurt Campbell, who has been tapped by Biden to serve as the coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs. Earlier this month, he wrote a piece with another scholar raising concerns about China's incursions in the East China Sea, the attempts to build islands in the South China Sea, the threats to invade Taiwan and the conflict with India. Campbell says that America must bolster its alliances with partners like India and then use them to push back against China. For now, Biden's priority seems to be the issues at home, the domestic challenges. He got down to work on day one of his administration, on the day of the inauguration itself, in fact. Biden signed more than a dozen executive actions yesterday. It was a full-scale assault on the legacy of Donald Trump. With his signatures, Joe Biden swept aside Donald Trump's pandemic response. He reversed Trump's economic agenda. He killed the anti-immigration policies. He stopped funding to Trump's border wall. He rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement and the World Health Organization. And with these executive actions, Joe Biden signaled that, that his administration will be different from Team Trump. Well, it remains to be seen how differently they tackle China. Talking about differences, this one's pretty obvious. Long before he won, Joe Biden had promised that if he gets elected as president, he will build a team that, quote unquote, looks like America, diverse, inclusive and young. I'm not too sure about the last promise, but Team Biden will indeed be a diverse slate. The choices represent a diversity of ideology, of background, race and religion. Just look at the White House team. 61% of the White House appointees are women, 54% are people of color, 11% members of the LGBTQ community, 20% first generation Americans and 40% of them have children at home. What about the cabinet picks? Again, it's a motley crew. In fact, many of the nominees will be pioneers in their respective roles, people who have broken barriers and shattered glass ceilings with their appointments. Here's a report. The first woman to serve as Treasury Secretary. The first woman to lead national intelligence. The first Black Defence Secretary. The first Latino Health Secretary. The first Native American Cabinet Secretary. The first Latino Head of Homeland Security. The youngest Secretary of State in decades. And the first openly gay man confirmed to a Cabinet role in American history. There are many inspiring firsts. Joe Biden plans to use America's diversity as an essential strength in his cabinet. At the Department of Justice, Judge Merrick Garland has been nominated to serve as America's next Attorney General. A 68-year-old centrist, this is Garland's third nomination to the US Supreme Court. At the Department of Commerce, Gina Raimondo has been nominated as Commerce Secretary. If confirmed, she will be the fourth woman to hold this position. At the Department of Education, Miguel Cardona has been nominated as the head. 
He is currently the Commissioner of Education in Connecticut. If confirmed, Cardona will be the second Puerto Rican and the third Latino Secretary of Education. At the Department of Interior, U.S. Representative from New Mexico, Deb Haaland, has been nominated for the position of Interior Secretary. If confirmed, 60-year-old Haaland will be the first Native American to become a Cabinet Secretary. A rising star in the Democratic Party and a familiar name among millennials, Pete Buttigieg, has been nominated as Transportation Secretary. If confirmed, the 39-year-old will be the first LGBTQ person to hold a cabinet post in America. Next, the Department of Energy. The former mayor of Michigan, Jennifer Granholm, has been appointed as Secretary of Energy, a strong advocate for zero-emission vehicles. 61-year-old Granholm will only be the second woman to serve as Secretary of Energy. Janet Yellen has been appointed as Treasury Secretary. She will be the first woman ever to hold this post. Yellen was also the first woman to chair the US Federal Reserve in the Obama era. Another important and unprecedented nomination is of Lloyd Austin, a retired four-star army general who has been nominated to head the Department of Defense. If confirmed, Lloyd Austin will be the first black defense secretary the first black chief of Pentagon in American history. Xavier Becerra has been nominated to steer the Department of Health and Human Services. If confirmed, the 62-year-old will be the first Latino to head the department. At the Office of Management and Budget, Neera Tandon, an Indian American, has been nominated to serve as the director. If her name is confirmed, she will be the first woman of colour and the first South Asian American to lead the office. Alejandro Mayorkas has been nominated to head the Department of Homeland Security. If confirmed, he will be the first Latino American and the first immigrant to lead this agency. An agency which is in charge of implementing American Looking after national intelligence will be Avril Haines. She will be the first woman to lead America's intel community. And working in tandem with her will be Jack Sullivan. He has been appointed as the National Security Advisor. At age 43, Sullivan will be the youngest person to hold the position since the Eisenhower administration. America's representative at the global stage, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, she has been nominated as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. If confirmed, she would be only the second black woman to hold the post. And lastly, the Department of State. Replacing the dynamic Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State will be Antony Blinken. As the country's top diplomat, Blinken will play a pivotal role in rebuilding America's alliances, re-enter agreements with Iran and halt his country's exit from the World Health Organization. The confirmation of these names is a given, since Democrats have won control of the Senate too. So once these appointments are made, the Biden-Harris administration will be the most diverse in American history. Bureau Report, we on World is One. It's the start of a new era and... We are tracking what Joe Biden is doing. All eyes are on him. But what about the president who is left? What will Donald Trump do now? Will he leave politics? Will he re-enter business? Will he fight legal battles or just play golf? Because that's what most former presidents do. Spend their time between golf, libraries, paid speeches and memoirs. But Donald Trump has never been like his predecessors. The disgruntled former president has not even said a word on whether he will accept any of his post-presidential perks. Trump is entitled to an annual pension of around $219,000, travel allowances, funds for office space and staff salary. The combined amount is more than $1 million. But the American law leaves room for discretion. For example, it allows the current administration to decide what kind of office space is quote-unquote suitable for the former president. Say Donald Trump chooses to turn one of his resorts into office, the administration may choose to not consider it suitable. Former presidents also receive intelligence briefings. It's a tradition, not a law. So the Biden administration can decide to cut Trump off from the briefings. We haven't heard what they plan to do. 
Former American presidents receive personal security protection. They are protected by the state secret service. But here again, the Department of Homeland Security is allowed to deny that protection to Trump. The Congress, too, is allowed to amend the law to strip Trump of that perk. So there's a big question mark hanging against post Trump's post-retirement benefits. What will he get? What about his post-presidential house? Where will Donald Trump live? Mara Lago, he says. It's a golf resort in Florida. Donald Trump bought it in 1985, turned it into a private club. Now he's landed there and his wealthy neighbors are already complaining. Apparently, you cannot live there permanently because this area is a social club. That's the law. Cannot live there permanently. So we don't know how long the Trumps plan to live there. What about contesting an election? Trump says he will be back. Does that mean he will run for president in 2024? The answer is maybe. Had you asked this question to me earlier this month, say before the 6th of January, I would have said definitely he will contest. But the capital carnage has changed a lot for Donald Trump. A rerun is not going to be easy. Problem number one, the Republican Party is divided over him, so much so that 10 Republicans have already supported the Democrats to impeach Donald Trump. Problem number two, many corporations and businesses have said they will not sponsor leaders who back Donald Trump. Problem number three, Trump's upcoming Senate trial. If he's convicted, he will never be able to run for president again, or for that matter, any federal office. Problem number four, how will Trump mobilize his supporters? He's lost his social media followers. How will he raise campaign funds online? Reports say Trump is launching a new party. It's been called the Patriot Party. We do not have much information on it. Neither can we verify it. And if it's true, it's only a matter of time before Trump himself tells you all about this party. If not politics, what will Donald Trump do? Perhaps go back to calling the shots at the Trump organization, his family business, the one that he never completely left, even when he became president. His politics has hurt his business too. Brand Trump has taken a hit. His golf club has lost the 2022 PGA Championship. Across the Atlantic, RNA has pulled out of the Turnberry Golf Resorts. Same story in the hotel business. Several properties have exited Trump management contracts, removed Donald Trump's name from their buildings. Trump's divisive politics dealt a blow. So did the Wuhan virus. The real estate empire is not booming. The Trump organization is sitting on a $1 billion debt. $1 billion, and the company's only lender, Deutsche Bank, has severed ties with Trump. The Trump organization is currently being run by his sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump. If Trump returns to his business, he'll have to look outside the United States. What about his retail business? Did you know that Donald Trump has lent his name to apparel and accessories, eyewear designs, fragrances, furniture, sweet treats, drinkware, even coffee? Trump owns restaurants, Trump books, and Trump ice, his very own brand of bottled water. What happens to all of them? Many of these products have been dropped from the shelves of major retailers like Macy's, all thanks to Trump's politics. Well, here's another question. Will Trump disappear from TV sets completely? Very unlikely, we say. This is one thing that we all agree on, I assume. Donald Trump is good television. We already miss him. People like to watch him. They want to know more about him. Will publishing houses approach Trump for a memoir? Of course they will. The Obamas were reportedly paid $65 million in advance for their memoirs. Experts say Trump's book will sell more than the, books of the, the book of the Obamas. But will he have the time to write one? Well, we'll be, he'll be keeping busy in the weeks ahead. Donald Trump is facing numerous legal threats. Some of them go back to his pre-White House days. Trump is being probed for tax evasion. Authorities in New York are also probing his business dealings. There is an investigation on Trump organization's inflated asset values. Donald Trump could also face deposition in two sexual assault cases. And how can we forget? his conduct post the election. From false claims to election fraud, of election fraud, to asking election officials to find votes and the capital carnage, Democrats are likely to go out and go out of their way to hold Trump accountable. Trump may be out of a job right now, but he has a lot on his plate and we'll be tracking. They say nothing is free in this world and tech giants are learning it the hard way. Google will now have to pay news publishers for carrying their content online. This agreement 
has been done with France, and it comes at a time when countries around the world are mulling similar measures. Our next report tells you why India should make tech giants pay for news too. This is a first for Europe. Google will now pay news publishers for carrying their content online. The deal comes after months of bargaining, after the European Union revamped its copyright rules. At the heart of these changes is a simple fact. Tech giants take content for free and make profits. This money is not shared with news websites or content creators. The rise of the internet has led to a decline in circulation. The result has been a massive drop in revenues for news organizations worldwide while the profits of the tech giants have skyrocketed. Google made more than $4 billion from the news industry in 2018. Combined with Facebook, both tech giants ferry more than 80% of the external traffic to different websites. This iron grip of big tech on what users read, watch or listen to gives these companies enormous powers. Developed economies around the world are realizing the need for a level playing field. Besides Europe, Australia too wants tech giants to pay for news. Last year in December, the Australian government tabled its own law. Our legislation will help ensure that the rules of the digital world mirror the rules of the physical world. That's been our intention all along to ensure that the rules of the digital world mirror the rules of the physical world and ultimately to sustain our media landscape here in Australia. The proposed law forces Google and Facebook to negotiate a fair payment with news organizations for using their content. The tech giants have been fighting this legislation tooth and nail. Google says the law will fundamentally damage Google search. Facebook says it might block news on its platform. Law. The American political establishment has jumped in to rescue these tech companies. Just before Donald Trump asked Australia to scrap the proposed law. But the Australian government has refused to relent. The new laws were only a matter of time. Already, Facebook has been asked to pay news publishers tens of millions of dollars in the United Kingdom. With Google now being forced to pay for news in France, the day isn't far when other tech companies start getting invoices from publishers. India needs to track these trends and follow suit. Vice President Venkaiah Naidu has already called for revenue sharing between social media companies and the traditional media. The Indian government must step in to break the monopoly of big tech. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison has drawn fire over his comments on the 26th of January. What significance does the day hold for Australia? Why is it a national holiday in Australia? Why do some Australians call 26th of January the day of mourning? Our next report has the answers. It wasn't a particularly flash day for the people on, on, on those vessels either. This comment has earned Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison a lot of scolding. One senator advised him to read the room. Another blasted him for being ignorant and unhelpful. A third leader accused Scott Morrison of dividing Australia. So, what's the whole story? It wasn't a particularly flash day for the people on, on, on those vessels either. Morrison was referring to the 26th of January. The day marks the British invasion of Australia. It was on the 26th of January 1788 that the first fleet of British ships reached Australia. They captured the lands of the Aboriginals. Also the Torres Strait Islanders. Massacred them and declared British sovereignty in the continent. In 1935, the 26th of January was termed Australia Day. It has been a public holiday since 1994. The day is marked by games of cricket, festivities and celebration. But not everyone likes to celebrate. For the Aboriginal people, the 26th of January marks a day of mourning. They rightly refer to it as Invasion Day. <laughs> this
This year, Cricket Australia decided to acknowledge their sentiment. It dropped references to Australia Day from the promotional material of the 2020 Big Bash League Games. Three Big Bash League franchises also decided to wear indigenous kits. The inclusivity did not impress Morrison. Now on Australia Day, it's all about acknowledging how far we've come. You know, when those 12 ships turned up in Sydney all those years ago, it wasn't a particularly flash day for the people on, on, on those vessels either. The number of ships that arrived in Australia were 11 and not 12. And there is absolutely no way colonisation and progress can be put in the same sentence. What the Prime Minister has said makes no sense, said Australian leader Linda Burney. Australia's former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said, and I quote, Morrison is gutless and so afraid of offending the far right that he bashes Cricket Australia for honouring the first Australians. On New Year's Eve, Scott Morrison had said that his government would change Australia's national anthem. The reference to the country being young and free will be dropped to acknowledge the history of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. What happened to continuing with that sense of inclusivity? Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. It's been called the deadliest attack in Iraq in three years. Central Baghdad was rocked by twin bombings. More than 30 lives have been lost, more than 100 people injured. In an election year for Iraq, this attack could just be a lead up to the vote. And with the U.S. withdrawing military support from the country, Iraq's security remains its biggest challenge. Pakistan. Pakistan. A huge open-air market in central Baghdad teeming with people. Now cordoned off and strewn with bodies and blood-stained clothes. Thursday's attack is the deadliest in the Iraqi capital since January 2018. Over 30 lives have been lost. More than 100 people have been injured so far. Iraq's health ministry has mobilized medics as paramedics work to remove the casualties. According to an interior ministry statement, the first suicide bomber rushed into the market. He claimed to be sick. A crowd surrounded him. Then, when he detonated the explosives, the idea was to create maximum impact. Soon, people flocked around the victims. And on cue, a second attacker detonated his bomb. We were there by the stands. One came, fell to the ground and started complaining. My stomach is hurting. And he pressed the detonator in his hand. It exploded immediately. People were torn to pieces. A lot of people were in it. Many people died and were injured. No terror group has claimed responsibility so far, but the Iraqi military has hinted at ISIS. The way and the enemy are clear. As far as I know, there is no official declaration. But for sure, maybe the terrorist organization Islamic State is behind this criminal incident. The hardline Sunni Muslim group had earlier captured vast areas of Iraq. They imposed their own rule but were defeated in 2017 by Iraqi forces backed with U.S. air power. The group's territorial defeat in 2017 meant an end to suicide bombings. Baghdad's last large-scale attack took place two years ago. That too at the Tehran Square, killing at least 27 people which makes Thursday's twin bombings a significant marker. This could be in the lead-up to this year's election. It's in line with Iraq's record. Bombings and assassinations in the run-up to election. Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kademi had originally set the election a year ahead of schedule. This was in response to widespread protests in 2019. But lately, authorities were in talks over rescheduling to October only to give electoral authorities more time to register voters and new parties. Not to forget, it is the United States that was providing the bulk of force to Iraq, including training, drone surveillance and airstrikes. But with only 2,500 U.S. troops now left in Iraq, security remains the biggest challenge. Bureau report, we on World is One.
On that note, it's a wrap. I'll leave you with this joint video message by Bill Clinton, George W. Bush and Barack Obama, three former U.S. presidents calling on Americans to embrace the new president, Joe Biden's message of unity. Thanks for watching. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I'm pulling for your success. Your success is our country's success, and God bless you. I'm glad you're there, and I wish you well. You have spoken for us today. Now you will lead for us, and we're ready to march with you. Good luck. God bless you. Joe, I'm proud of you, uh, and you and Kamala uh, need to know that you've got all of us here rooting for your success keeping you in our prayers uh, and we will be available in any ways that we can as citizens to, to help 